everyone, welcome to God's Plan, Your Part, Year 2, where this year we're reading through and studying the entire New Testament, one chapter at a time. Thanks again for joining us in discovering God's plan and your part in it. So today we are in chapter 27 of the book of Matthew, and if you're anything like me, you've probably heard this story or set of stories from chapter 27 about the death of Jesus and his, I guess, his trial before Pilate. I feel like I've heard these stories many times, uh, but there have been a couple of things that have kind of uh, poked out and like, I don't know, we've seen or are beginning to see in a different light. Uh, One of those things that Ryan was alluding to earlier before we started the episode was um, how Jesus is, again, he's fulfilling prophecies throughout this entire book, or excuse me, throughout this entire chapter, but a lot of it is out of his control. Um, So there's actually a lot of credibility there for Jesus and his mission simply because of that. Um, And then there's like this goofy little weird verse (laughs) at the very end that I don't think if Ryan wouldn't have said anything about it, I probably would have just like glossed right over it. So I guess the chapter kind of starts out with Jesus being handed over to Pilate, which is always a unique thing because I, I know even from your studying of Pilate, there's like always this question of, well, was he actually like for Jesus or was he annoyed by Jesus? Like what was the deal with, with Pilate? Pilate is such a compelling character. There's two compelling people at the at the beginning of 27, Pilate and Judas. And we need to talk about both. Yeah. Um, Pilate is so wildly interesting because I think the thing that gets my attention with him I think he's just a crafty politician. Like he's he's placed in this region of Judea. Uh, Roman governors did not like being there. Sometimes it was kind of like a Roman punishment to be put there. Ooh. He's just trying to keep the peace. I don't know if he cares much about Jesus, but he does make the official charge against Jesus, the king of the Jews. And we do know from the other gospels that he's very firm on calling him the king of the Jews. Did he do that to mock the Jews? Did he do that to honor the the deity of Christ? He's he's definitely very taken by Jesus. Uh, he's taken off guard by Jesus. His wife has some kind of like I think Holy Spirit inspired dream, um, telling Pilate or t- telling Pilate's wife uh, that Jesus is indeed a righteous man, and like that's not revealed to her by accident. How many how many people did Pilate oversee and punish? Mm-hmm. Tons of them. Many. And his wife is like, whoa, like you need to treat this guy differently because there's something very different Don't about this man. Him. And and church history is wild with speculation about, about Pilate. You will find people that say he was definitely a wicked man. You will find people that say he seems like he might have became a Christian. And you will find people who say he became like a missionary. A missionary. So th- we are all over the place. And I don't know. I don't know. He's definitely a compelling figure. I think... I've made this case before. The most interesting thing about Pilate is he was face to face with Jesus, probably at least twice, like with a personal audience with Jesus. He's intrigued by Jesus. And the best we can say about his life is like, "Eh, maybe, maybe he came to know Jesus. Like, that's not great. Mm -hmm. And so the, the challenge for us today is like, don't end up in the same spot. Like, don't have personal interactions with Jesus and not have it evident that it has changed your life and changed who you are. Yeah. So then we also have Judas, who is at the beginning of this chapter too. And at this point, Judas like can't even live with himself and takes his own life because of what he has done to Jesus or against Jesus. And what's so ironic, you had mentioned this at the beginning of the chapter, is that the same money that he was paid, all of the sudden the the Pharisees are uninterested in taking that money back. They obviously don't care about honoring God with their actions, but they definitely don't mind having people think that they're honoring God with their actions. Yeah. And poor Judas, man, there's a lot of debate and a lot of discussion about Judas. Like he was obviously chosen for this task. Like, like it's not m- a mistake that Judas ended up betraying Jesus. If he hadn't done that, there would be some problems. Um, But it's this weird blend, kind of like Pharaoh in Exodus. It's this weird blend of they were not righteous people and they were handed over um, to their own evil desires and their own wickedness to serve God's righteous purposes. Mm -hmm. So did God choose Judas to do this? Yes. Yes. And it is some kind of weird blend of 
Judas was not a God-honoring person, and God used this non-God-honoring person to betray his one and only son who was given up for the sins of the world. So it is this unique blend, and depending on your whatever, your faith tradition, you have different interpretations of this and maybe you struggle with this. But there's no question that like this is part of the redemption narrative. This is a big part of the story. Mm -hmm. But it's also interesting to see that Judas has this personal crisis of like, what have I done? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and what in the world? This is awful. And he and hangs I think that himself. sometimes can get really ignored too because in our minds, at least mine, when you're reading through these stories, anytime that Judas is mentioned, you're like, oh, he's going to be the guy. But at the same time, I, it is easily looked over that he actually was very remorseful of it to the point where he's like willing to take his own. Well, he does take his own life. Matthew is the only one that records that Judas did experience regret. Mm -hmm. And it does bring like this personal nature to Judas that we wouldn't have if it wasn't recorded. Right. Um, and it also exposes the extreme hypocrisy of the religious leaders. Like, like the way that they're acting is insane. Mm hmm. Well, then we kind of we continue to go through the story that I'm sure many of us are familiar with, with uh, basically the crowd demanding that Jesus be uh, pretty much put to death in return for Barabbas, who was a well-known criminal at the time. Uh, Jesus is hung on the cross. He's mocked. He is, I mean, he put they put a sign over his head that he is the king of the Jews, uh, which is, again, that question again, like, was Pirate... Er, pirate? <laughs> was Pilate trying to be um, mocking in that same way towards Jesus or towards the Jews with this sign that is hung over him? Um, but anyway, we go through this whole story to get to the end where, like, when Jesus is actually taking his final breath, we get to this really funky, weird verse. Jesus basically forfeits his soul over, like, or his spirit over. He is, he's died. The curtain in the temple is torn in two. The rock splits. And then we have this really strange verse, verse 52. It says, The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. <laughs> so this is kind of weird. And you didn't notice that? <laughs> I mean, I, again, like, I think I get so hung up on, like, whoa, the curtain was torn. Because that's significant. Like, that separated the most holy place from any other person outside of the high priest. The rocks were split. Like, we have actually seen those things. Well, not the curtain, but the rock we have seen, like, up close and personal. So it's like, man, I remember that. So It's real. This next it's verse real. is just like, oh, I'm still thinking about the cool times that we spent in Israel seeing these things. So just to sweep us up to the point that we want to talk about. Um, Jesus on the cross says, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. He's quoting Psalm 22. So for extra credit for today's episode, go back and read Psalm 22. It's the last scripture that Jesus is quoting out loud on the cross, um, while he's dying. Yeah. So if you want to know Jesus like dying thoughts, you can read them. It's Psalm 22. You should definitely go read them. Um, after he dies, the, the rock, it says, what, what, what verse is that? 51, the rocks were split. That's real. Mm -hmm. We can prove it. And that is so important to our faith. It is a provable fact. We know where the cross was. We know that the rock that the, the, the cross was in is split from top to bottom. You can fly to Israel right now and you can see it with your own eyes. And touch it. It's and, really weird. And it's like behind this plexiglass. You kind of go down and around and behind and it's there and you can see it and it's real. And I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, oh my goodness. How has no one in my whole life ever told me this? Because I was probably like, I don't know how old was I, like 25 when I saw it. Yeah. Um, and so I don't want you listeners to be in the same spot. You need to know that this is real and you can actually go see it and you can take a picture of it and you can prove it. Now, to the weird stuff that you can't take a picture of and you can't prove. <laughs> <laughs> what is up with these people roaming around? Look at verse 52. The, holy city. the tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tomb after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. There's a lot of opinions on this. Um, we, we post this to YouTube. I would love to see the YouTube comments full of what you guys think of this verse. I'm not going to tell you exactly what this means, by no means am I going to venture out on that limb and be like, this is exactly what happened. Um, but I do want to like tell you some of the perspectives. One, the most hilarious one I read is, well, there's an earthquake and there were bodies in tombs. So when the, when the, when the earthquake broke all the rocks, the tombs broke open and all the bodies fell out. That's gross. That seems very logical actually. Um, one take on this is that Matthew loves to exaggerate things 
and he loves to like put some flair in there. I, I just finished up reading an article that said this is first century CGI. He's telling a story with wild <laughs> details to basically illustrate the power of Christ's death and resurrection. Mm-hmm. There are obviously problems with that because you would be saying to some degree that what Matthew recorded is not true. And what Matthew is saying in these details is like between very factual things that he's he's supporting with real details and they're core to our faith. So it's not great to have like one sentence in three sentences that define our faith where one's like, well, that's probably not real. (laughs) I, I don't know. If you think that's true, like, please put it in the comments and tell me like why you think that's true and how you support that. Um, the second thing that I was reading is that there was this belief in the Old Testament that the Old Testament saints would be waiting till the appointed time that is the end of days. And when we reach the end of days, the Old Testament saints would be resurrected mm-hmm. and they would be like united in God's kingdom. And so one of the thoughts is that Matthew is, he's remember, he's trying to serve a Jewish audience and teach a Jewish audience about the reality of the power of the resurrection, how it fulfills all the scriptures. So Matthew is ensuring that he is telling people that these passages have been fulfilled and God's kingdom is now here and we have entered into the last days. So it's Mm -hmm. kind of like this theological perspective where, where like what he's saying is not it's not a lie. It's not CGI it's like to use the other teams, too. but it's reassurances yeah. to the audience. Uh, the third one is that these people did indeed rise from the dead, come out of the grave, and they walked around in the holy city and they like interacted with people and talked with people and saw people. I mean, I know we have hesitations about that, which give me al- weird like Day of the Dead vibes. It's always interesting to me that we hesitate over certain things and like we're fine with other things. So it's like it's not weird to us to say, well, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. He ate with people. He visited with people, and then it's like, well, other people did that too. It's like, nah, no, 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 that's too far. Yeah, but okay. So how many times then do people like me read this verse and then realize like, wait a minute, I've read that a bunch of times yeah. and it's only sinking in now. Yeah. So so one way to look at it is these were real people. They actually did rise from the dead. They did go into the holy city. They did witness about the power of the resurrection by their own physical presence and they died a second death or they lived among the people until Jesus ascension and they ascended into heaven with Jesus. We are not elevating these people to mm-hmm. the height of Jesus. We're not recognizing that they are God. None of that. We're, we're trying to bring depth to what is said here in Matthew, and it's definitely a bizarre passage, and please don't hear me saying, like, this is the correct one. But I think with this, I have represented, as best I can, the views <laughs> that I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, and I think, too, like, if we believe that Jesus can raise Lazarus from the dead, I, I don't know. I'm not super uncomfortable believing that other people rose from the dead. Well, like, I think about people like... Um, well, I guess Simeon, he saw Jesus before he died, mm-hmm. but at the same time, he would have like gone to the grave knowing that Jesus was coming. Um, so like I envision him being like raised up, but I guess this was like those who were awaiting Jesus, but still it's like, it's crazy. All these faithful believers beforehand that were like, they didn't know what it was going to look like, but they knew something was coming and are now resurrected with Christ. It's like, Sure. You know what? <laughs> you put in your time. Go for it. Uh, I should also call out, and I should have called this out earlier. My apologies. But verse 53 says, and coming out of the tomb after his resurrection. Yeah, after. So I should have recognized this at the top, but this is out of place chronologically because he's saying after his resurrection, but he has not yet recorded his resurrection. So this right. is a detail that he's inserting that occurred later. It's kind of like all these cool things happen. So I'm just going to clump them together right here yes. because two of those things, I'm assuming the, the curtain and the, the rock that They're, would have been at his death or would that have also been at, at his, his death? Yeah. They would have been okay. at his death and they would have been easily verifiable. And then this other piece is like the resurrection piece that gets tacked on right. with it. So, so according to his own words, this happened later, no matter what, no matter how you see this or deal with this, Matthew is uh, assuring us that this did occur. And, three other guys are assuring us that this did occur Mm -hmm. and all their all these guys gave their lives saying that this is true and they would not recant it and that is like very critical for us to know and recognize because it means that our faith is worthy of living for because many people who or dying for because many people who saw it believed it and lived their whole lives for it Mm -hmm. and we can do the same we can trust that what they said is true is not made up 
So what's a what's a good your part for us today? How do we land this thing with a an applicable your part? I would say take your pick. I mean, the hilarious thing that that you just said is don't be like Judas, don't be like Pilate. Um, <laughs> she gets credit because we cut it out, but that is what she said. <laughs> the second thing is like if you're a Bible nerd, even if you're not a Bible nerd, really get to know these reasons that we know the resurrection is real and true and we can trust it because we actually can defend it. It's not some like mystical thing that we Mm -hmm. just like believe and there's no evidence. There's actually a lot of evidence and we can support it and we can defend it and and not to win debates, understand. Right. But know that we're not like pulling this out of nowhere and it's like hokey dokey weirdness. Like this really did happen. People died saying it did happen and there remains physical evidence to show at least what Matthew wrote and and the other writers. Mm -hmm. It's true. And it's real and you can see it. So I hope you are affirmed in our in your faith. I hope you're encouraged in your faith. Uh, we'll be wrapping up Matthew tomorrow with Matthew 28. We'll see you then. Thanks for joining today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. As always, please consider partnering with us as we are a listener-supported podcast that we hope to continue to grow with support from listeners just like you. We've made it super easy to partner with us and you can support us by following the link in our show notes or our description. You can support us with as little as $3 a month. Every little bit of this helps so much and we're so thankful for your support. With that in mind, here's today's reading. Matthew chapter 27. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. Then, when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave them no answer, not even a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted, and they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him, and took the reed, and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, and put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross, and when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, 
They offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If he desires him, for he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabathani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after the resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what had taken place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this is the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that impostor said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. Don't forget, you can find us on just about every social media platform and YouTube. Let us know what you thought of today's episode, and if you have any questions, go ahead and post them there. You can also reach out to us directly at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. As always, if you don't have a Bible, or if you'd like to use the one that we use, uh, reach out to us via email and we'll be happy to send one to you. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you again tomorrow.